it, um, oh, that's, yeah, that's that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, before we get started, I do want to say again thank you to Karen for including me in uh, this enrichment. It's always good to uh, be with our friends and uh, co-laborers in many respects uh, for the work that you do with, with Viki. And always good to be with Mama Rosemary. Um, you know, it was funny years ago. Um, I think she had come to do something in our church in Compton. And I said, Rosemary, you're my girl. And she says, well, what does that make you to me? I said, I'm your dog. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, she's my girl. And <laughs> So we would, uh, you know, so it's, 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 and she, she was on me for years to be able to come in the field uh, long before we went to, um, to Kenya. So we got a chance to do it for the first time in 2002. So that's been a delight. So, and then Karen, our co-58, do not say class of 58 ever <laughs> again. <laughs> we are the pride of 58. But we are not the class of 58, but always good to be with, with you. And it is always a delight, and especially in the latter 10, 15, or 15, 20 years of ministry, to always be able to have my wife with me, my lovely wife, 41 years. 41 years, 41 years, exactly 10 years behind you guys, so yeah, so. Well, <laughs> so it is always a delight, and as per usual, and I mentioned before, I am always enriched by um, sitting under the uh, word ministry of our dear friend and brother, uh, Dennis Johnson. Uh, one of the things that I, I had good, close relationships with people at uh, Westminster Seminary in Escondido, and one of the things that I appreciated about... Um, most of the men that I had the privilege of having uh, good, close relationships with is we grew up in an evangelical setting where uh, seminary was equivalent to cemetery, that kind of thing. <laughs> and um, it's, it's like other than, and you, you, you consider it for something other than those who are really have a passion for the Word of God. But uh, the thing that I appreciated about uh, many of the, the men there is, number one, they were churchmen, and that's, that makes a huge difference. But uh, they were men of the word, and they really were some, some wonderful, outstanding preachers, beginning with Bob Godfrey. Godfrey is first and foremost a preacher and, uh, and academic and doing all of the rest of it. That's just because of the passion for the word. And as I mentioned in my first um, address, that Dennis and I have had the privilege of sitting on committees together, preaching and conferences together. And the thing that I appreciate about him is he is an astute scholar, clearly an Old Testament scholar that is able to, to glean the truth, or actually New Testament, but he really puts the, the meta narrative together. And we appreciate that about him. But even more than that, because you can get that from a book, in a sense. But what he is, is a lover of Christ in his word and to his people. And so he communicates uh, the greatness of God's grace in Christ with such profundity and such clarity. And it's always a delight. And you never want to take moments when we are together for granted. I think that's one of the, um, one of the, features of our arrogance and our fallenness is we assume things. And so we assume that we will be able to say, or we assume that you know. And no matter how much I've told his brother how much I love him and appreciate his ministry in the word, we can never say it enough. So thank you again for opening up God's word for us. Now I saw that, uh, and Jane, because Jane, <laughs> yes. And, and the thing that I love about Jane is she is as profound in her silent smiles <laughs> as she is when she speaks. So we are delighted to always be able to, to share with people that we love and ha have been in long-standing fellowship with. Now, I saw that in my um, 
it's, it's stated that we'll pray, so is that at the beginning or at the close? Okay, we will give the opening prayer, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our God and our Father, we do come to you in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of life, and we thank you for the newness of life that you have granted us in him. As we have come together these past few days for the purpose of refreshment and enrichment and fellowship, we pray, Father, that you have been glorified in all of our doings, our conversations, our periods of study and sharing. We thank you for the refreshment that has been enjoyed by our missionaries who are here for a limited period of time. We thank you for granting them safety in their travels. And we pray that as each one returns to their various countries and the assignments that they've been given, that you would grant them traveling mercies, that any obstacles that may be there would be removed. We lift before you those who will be new to the field. We thank you for their zeal and their desire to serve you, and we pray that they would find things well when they reach their des destination. We thank you for the leadership here at Rafiki and all of the things that are done that, are, that contribute in their own way to making this what it is. So we thank you for those who have served in so many ways. We lift for each country that's represented here. You know the needs and circumstances of your people in those countries. Remind us that we are the kingdom of God, and as such, we extend to every part of this globe we know that this world is not our home in its present state, but you are the sovereign Lord over all of human history. So as we are in seasons of emergency, we see them as emergencies from our vantage point, but it's your sovereign purpose from yours. So strengthen us to be what we are called to be in the seasons in which we are. Strengthen us to be light, bright and shining lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Let us be avenues of mercy and voices of grace to those who are hurting. Let us be the ones who tell people what our ultimate issue is, and that is the need to be reconciled to the holy God. Thank you again for what you have granted in these days together. Be with us now in the time that remains. We pray that everything that is said and everything that is done would be to your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Today we want to, or this session, and by the way, I do have to apologize. Uh, initially, we said that we tried to be able to remain through lunch, but we'll probably have to leave early so that we can get ahead of some traffic as we head south. And so I want to offer some concluding thoughts here, and I want to be the first to tell you that um, five 45 minute sessions obviously is not enough to mine all of the riches that are contained in the book of Hebrews, and we know that, so I'm confessing, I know there's a lot of meat left on the bones, and that's, but that's okay. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, the apostle Paul tells his young protege, Timothy, that we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. And in a very similar vein, the author of Hebrews would also have his audience to know that the Levitical sacrifices and the priesthood and the temple and everything and all of the rituals that are in association with it are also good if you see how these things find their substance and find their fulfillment in the person and work of Christ. But on the flip side of it, if one does not see in all of these rituals, in all of these ceremonies, in all of these types, in all of these shadows, if one does not see the rich treasures of God's grace as they are set forth in the person and work of Christ, then the bottom line is that they are not using the law lawfully. Or as we saw in chapter 5, they are being, in essence, unskilled in the word of righteousness. If our takeaway or our bottom line from anything that we have gleaned from 
the law and especially the ceremonial and ritual laws associated with the Levitical priesthood. If they lead us to anything other than what God has given us in Christ and the holiness of the God who grants what is accomplished by these rituals, then we are unskilled in the word of God. And we are lacking the ability to distinguish between truth and error. And that may not seem like a big thing, but it's really a huge thing. And when it comes to understanding the things of God, if we are not clear in what God has revealed and what he has given, then we will forever be trying to earn what has been freely given by his grace. Or, as we saw in our second session yesterday, there are some very practical, important implications of not understanding what God has given us in Christ. It's not just a matter of having right knowledge to fill our heads, but if we are not able to comprehend from the scriptures, including the types and shadows of the ceremonial law, then we're not, and we are not able to comprehend the finished work of Christ as set forth in these types and shadows, then we will be prone to misinterpret God's disposition towards us as we go through various trials and all of our horizontal experiences. We will be prone to misunderstand and misrepresent God's care and God's love for us as we go through struggles, and even as we confront the fact of our own failures. And such uncertainty in those difficult seasons is a breeding ground for despair and discouragement. And so when we do not have the confidence that these basic elements that are set forth in these types and shadows when we do not have the confidence that they do not stand on their own, but rather that they are there to undergird, illustrate, and communicate to us the substance which is the fullness of the person and work of Christ, if we do not come away with that, then those things are deemed, even as the writer of Hebrews indicates in a number of places, they're weak. This is how the writer makes the argument that um, in the contrasting of the priesthood of the Levites and the priesthood of Christ, that if you take away one from the other, if you take away the, the person and finished work of Christ from the things that are illustrated in the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of the Levites is made to stand alone, it's a weak foundation. And again, this is the point that he is making over and over again as he deals with the order of Melchizedek, which Christ is of, and the order of the Levitical priests. One has their, their grounding in the law of God, and the other has it in uh, the command of God. Now, I want to look and actually we'll, we'll reference two places in this address. We'll be looking at uh, chapter 7, some portions of chapter 7, and then we'll conclude in chapter 12. And in doing so, what we'll do again is look at some of the contrasting arguments that the writer of Hebrews has concerning the, the Levitical priesthood versus the order of Melchizedek, which ultimately, obviously, is significant or in conjunction with the order of uh, the priesthood of Christ. So, for instance, in chapter 7, and look at verse 16. He, well, I'll back up to verse 15. It says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. And so basically, in that verse, he's saying, in effect, that the priest of the Levitical order are appointed on the basis of bodily or natural descent. 
In other words, the reason that they, they are born into their office. It is the particular tribe, or it is the tribe and descendants of, of, of Levi. And as older theologians would say, by accident of birth. If you were born into the tribe of Levi, you were a part of the, tr of the, of the priesthood. That's so it's, it's not by on the basis of, of their own desire. It's, not, it's, it's one of those things where you're born into this. This is, this, is what you, this is what you have been set apart for. So the basis of the appointment, yesterday we talked about um, the, the points of similar or the points of comparison and the points of contrast. And one of the points of comparison between the priesthood of the Levites and the priesthood of Christ is they are both divinely appointed. But there's distinction and contrast even within those appointments. The Levitical priesthood is appointed by natural descent, whereas Christ is appointed on the basis, and I love that phrase in verse 16, on the basis of his indestructible life. One is born into it, and there is, that is the basis of his appointment. The other one, who's, who is eternal, the eternal son of God, is appointed to it on the basis of his integrity and in person, on the basis of his own deity, on the basis of his commitment to the Father. He is appointed just as those other priests are appointed by virtue of birth to represent the one who is the coming eternal priest. The persons born into the Levitical priesthood are replaceable parts. So when one, when one priest is born and he has sons, whether they are good at it or not, they inherit the priesthood. We see this most clearly, and we see it in a number of places. The sons of Eli in the Old Testament, the sons of Samuel, the same thing. The fathers were better at their task and more committed to their task than the sons, but the sons were born into it. But here's the good news. When you have that season of bad priests, they're replaceable parts. So there will come a, another priest along to do the same job, and even though their tasks are set forth in the Word of God and set forth in the law of God in terms of what they ought to do, we know there are, there's variations and degrees of their corruption and personal imperfections. But if you have a season of a bad priest, lo and behold, there will come along a Samuel. There will come along another one, but the bottom line is they are replaceable parts, and the only reason one can draw near to God through the priesthood or through the ministry of this priesthood is because of its attachment to Christ. So in other words, even under the corrupt sons of Eli and the corrupt sons of Samuel, that is, as bad as they were morally, when they were performing their particular tasks, and so they were... They were fleecing and taking advantage of the position they were given, but when they were performing their particular task according to the prescribed law, the intended effect was still in place because it was their, their, their intercession wasn't because of them, it was in spite of them. Again, I want to quote Calvin here in making the distinction between the priesthood of the, the Levitical order when they are detached from the substance that is in Christ. Because the, the, with these replaceable parts, with variations in terms of their faithfulness individually, as long as they perform the works that were prescribed to them, the same, the same intended effect was the result of their ministry. But the only thing that gave it any substance wasn't the personality and it wasn't the morality, it wasn't the skill set of the individual priest, it was what it was attached to. And so the moment you remove Christ as the end and you are left with the ministry of that priesthood on its own, it collapses. Here's what Calvin says. He says the moment 
They are separated from Christ. They have nothing left but the weakness referred to here. In short, in short, he says, no benefit will be found in the ancient ceremonies until they are related to Christ. Anyone who still wants to or wants to restore the shadows of the law obscures the glory of Christ and puts a barrier between us and God. So as long as these replaceable parts did their job, they were actually pointing to a greater reality. And the point of the writer of Hebrews is saying, is the point that he is making is that if you do this, if you, if you do your job and you understand the work that's being done by the Levitical priesthood, then fine, they've done their job because they were always intended to be indicators of a greater reality. But he says, now that you've come to Christ, holding in mind, this is a Jewish audience who has been reared in the scriptures and in the ceremonies of the law. And he says, now, if you go back to these things, seeking from them what they were pointing towards, what you're actually doing is rejecting the very thing that's illustrated by these things. And so you think you're being brought close, but in fact, you're not. In fact, he says, you, you're trampling the things of God. Now, here we see also that the priesthood of Christ is not just that God is, appoints him on the basis of his, 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 eternal, his eternality and his own divine attributes, but God appoints him as the fulfillment of his own divine oath. Look in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 7. It says, beginning in verse 20, And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. In other words, God, doesn't, God says, here, I'm going to give you this priesthood. All of the ceremonies they perform are according to the law, illustrating the fullness of what was promised in Genesis 3.15, progressively unveiled, uh, unveiled throughout the rest of redemptive history, culminating in the giving of the Mosaic law with the building of the tabernacle, all of the furnishings, the whole priesthood, all of the sacrifices, all of these things are intended for a particular purpose. God's oath is not on these priests, but in what he has promised and that is in the substance and fulfillment of Christ. So, as we said, they are replaceable parts that are born into this capacity. But what God does when he appoints his only begotten son, and we see once again that the writer quotes from Psalms 110, what he does when he appoints Christ is he makes an oath. In verse 21, it says, But... This one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. That's not, what, that's not the oath of God that he puts on the Levitical priesthood. It is the oath that he puts on his son. And this goes back to what we've been addressing the past couple of days concerning the covenant of redemption, which is the inner Trinitarian eternal covenant within the Godhead for all of the elements and aspects of human salvation. The Father determining and decreeing since before the foundation of the world to bring to salvation those who have fallen in Adam that he has designated for salvation and the Son has entered into eternal covenant agreement with the Father to procure the salvation of those who have been determined by the Father. But hold in mind, the Father has determined to save fallen humanity through his eternal Son. It's never any guesswork. And so he has the agreement within the Godhead and the Holy Spirit 
has agreed from all eternity to bring application and enlightenment of the saving work of the Son on the behalf of the will and decree of the Father. And therefore, when God sends Christ or appoints him as the high priest, he makes an oath in and through the person of Christ. And therefore, Christ is the guarantee of the Father's oath. The Father, or is the, he is the guarantee of the Father's promise to, uh, to bring salvation, and that's what we see in verse 22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. And so the Father has sent forth the Son to accomplish everything that is illustrated by the sacrifices themselves, the priesthood, the altar, and everything associated with bringing men to a saving knowledge of God and bringing them into the presence of God where they can stand boldly as those who represent and reflect what God has intended from the beginning. So therefore, the priesthood of the Levites was always intended to point towards the person and work of Christ. And I think we pointed out yesterday in our first session that to reject what God has given in Christ and therefore go back to the, 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 the types and the shadows is equivalent to going uh, to, on Christmas morning, having gifts that are wrapped, opening up those gifts, throwing away the gift and playing with the wrapping. It's beautiful when it looks when it's when you see it under the tree, but it's only beautiful because of what it's what's contained within. So in this case, the difficulty here is which is a little bit different from what we see in the book of, of Galatians, where the Judaizers in the book of Galatians were saying yes to the Gentiles. It's good that you have faith in Christ, but now in addition to faith in Christ. You need to be justified on the basis of certain aspects of the ceremonial law. So they were combining law and gospel as a means of salvation. This is a little bit different because these Jewish believers weren't saying you need Christ and obedience to the law. They understood to some degree, at least early on, that Christ was the, fulfill, was the fulfillment of the messianic promises of the law, they just didn't fully understand what it meant to have him as that fulfillment, which is the point that Calvin makes earlier, that they, they didn't really know what they had. I think of what Peter says, that we have been given everything necessary for life and godliness in Christ. Now, do we always realize what we have? I don't think so. I think sometimes we, we underappreciate or undervalue what we already have, and it makes us think we are without something. And so I think that's why, and I don't know how it is in some African countries, we've been to all 10 places where there are Rafiki villages, but it's not uncommon for evangelical worship services to feature things that are intended to give you more breakthrough and blessings and anointings and laying ons of hands as if there is something in these things inherent rather than unfolding what we have in Christ. What Paul says to the Corinthians is true. What is it that you, 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 ha that you need that you don't have? You've been given everything. So therefore, there is no extra blessing. There is, whatever our shortcomings are, whatever our failures are, whatever our inability to fully see and appreciate what God has given us in Christ, whatever that may be, it's not because we need more. God has given us everything that is necessary for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there's no need to have anyone else enter 
intercede or intervene because Paul says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. So here's the, here's the trade-off. If we don't rest on the fullness of what is given in Christ, we will forever be on the escalator trying to get the next new big thing. Because there will, be never, there will never be enough. Either we have everything in Christ, or we have nothing from God. And brothers and sisters, where this really comes home, and this is the point that he's trying to make in chapter 7, that the priesthood of the Levites were intended to point to God's oath in the person of Christ. They're replaceable. Don't get caught up on your favorite priests in your favorite century because all of it was pointing to the one who was coming and to him, God has made an oath that everything that he has promised will be fulfilled in him. He himself is the guarantor of everything that God has promised. Now here's where it comes out. If we don't unpack the riches of God's glory and grace in the person and work of Christ, not only will we see that it will have consequences as we deal with the struggles and failures of life as we dealt with yesterday, but it also has everything to do with what you think you do when you come to worship. I know a lot of churches that we were people, Christians, you know, groups, we, we tout worship in gospel language. But it ends up being Sinai worship. Let's look at what, what the writer of Hebrews says about this. Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll look at verses 18 through 21 first. Because the end, if we disconnect the person and work of Christ from the ministry of the priestly or of the Levitical priesthood, then at best, regardless of our language, our worship can't be anything other than Sinai worship. Verses 18 through 21 of chapter 12. For you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Instead, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. And as Dennis has pointed out, this is really in reference to the Lord giving the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And remember how the people said, well, we want to go. We want to go with Moses. And the Lord says, okay, well, let them. Let them, let them get ready. And they got all gussied up and got ready to go. And this scene happens. And they say, well, Moses, you can go ahead. We'll, we'll listen to you when you get back. The giving of the law on Mount Sinai from the thrice holy God, which includes not only the, the, the civic laws, it, it, is, it centers on the, the, on the substance of the ceremonial law and the moral law of God. This is the God who commands. This is the God that do this and you will live. And the best that we can get from a priesthood that is disconnected from the substance of the person and work of Christ is a tour guide to Sinai. And that never works. In other words, what I mean by Sinai worship is approaching God on the basis of human works 
in human ability and human merit. If we, and when, by human, I mean personal and individual. And so I say this oftentimes because when it comes to a lot of Christian worship, we do approach God sometimes with the language of here am I. It's almost an unmediated worship that we are seeking to stand before God. Here I am and I'm good and I'm ready and I love you with my whole heart and Christ is not often present. It's on the basis of our own merits and ability that we come. And so in that case, you see, worship has to deal seriously with the holiness of God that is on display at Sinai. And if all we have is faith in the Levitical priesthood disconnected from Christ, then we don't have a good mediator because then we are left with the mediation of people themselves that are not able to stand in the presence of God. The writer gives us another form of worship. He says, notice what he says in verse 18, you have not come. So our worship of God, our approach to God, our interaction with God is not because our priest has led us to Sinai with all of its fire and with all of its trembling. In verse 22, he says, but you have come. You have come to, uh, to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal or feastal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to, sprinkle, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. He says, we've come to Mount Zion. Now, it's already been noted the correlation between Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is the place we read in the book of Genesis where the Lord requires Abraham to offer up his son. And when Abraham draws his hand back with the knife to bring it down and sacrifice Upon uh, to, to offer his, his son Isaac as a sacrifice, the angel of the Lord stays his hand. And he says, no, that's okay, Abraham. The Lord himself will provide. And then he looks into, he looks into the bush and there is a ram. Well, the ram isn't what the Lord would provide, but it's a substitute. And so Abraham is able to offer up a ram instead of his son on Mount Moriah. And it is interesting that when, when the Lord put the, t the challenge to David, how do you want to handle this sinful situation here, that, that David says, well, put me in your hands. And then he buys a threshing floor on the, uh, it, that was owned by a gentleman. And there, around the area of Mount Moriah, becomes the place that eventually becomes the temple where the, Lord, where the Lord allows his name to dwell. And that becomes, in the Old Testament, Mount Zion. Not a big, impressive mountain like Mount Kilimanjaro or anything like that. But years later, where Mount Zion was, just outside of Jerusalem, there is a little hill. And it's called Calvary. And we know that Jesus himself was lifted up on a cross in the region, in the area of what would have been Mount Moriah, Mount Zion. And what takes place on Calvary is that another father is now offering his son up in the very mountain where Abraham was willing to offer his son. 
And when Abraham was ready to bring down the knife with the fury of the Lord, the Lord holds his hand. But 2,000 years ago, the heavenly father offers up his son. And there is no one to stay his hand. And now we do not go to Mount Sinai, lest the wrath that fell upon the Son should fall upon us. But because we can now, through the priesthood of the everlasting Son of God, our worship is not Sinai worship. Our worship is Zion worship. We come into the very presence of God where the demands of his law at Sinai have been met and satisfied by the son that is offered up on Zion. And therefore we can always go boldly into the presence of God. Let's go back and see how Paul or how the writer expresses this in Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Pause there for a moment. You notice the difference? We have confidence. Notice again in chapter 12, we do not come to Mount Sinai where there's no confidence, where even if an animal touched the mountain, it would be burned, but we can go into the presence of the flaming holiness of God because of the blood of Jesus. And not only can we go, we can go with confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, and that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a pure heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And notice this phrase, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. What do we mean by confession? A statement of agreement. And here is our confession, that Jesus has lived for the righteousness that God requires of me, and that he died to pay the penalty that I owed, and he lives to ever make intercession for me. He lived for my righteousness, died for my sins, was raised for my justification, and he has ascended into the heavens behind the veil so that I could have boldness to come before the Father in my time of need. Let us hold fast to that confession because of the efficacy of the work of our great high priest. And it's for this reason, he says, now, and, and I love the connection, now that you are right with God and you know that and you can stand boldly, he says, now look around you, pay close attention to those around you. Pay close attention to one another to seek your opportunity to stir up everyone unto love and good works because we know that we belong to him. Brothers and sisters, here's what we know. If we handle the ceremonial ritual law rightly, we will rightly perceive what God has given and done in Christ. If we look at these things as ends in themselves, we don't have enough oil on the market to make up for what we're lacking. 
if we see the fullness of what these things represent, then we will be encouraged to trust and fully trust the finished work of Christ and the excellency of the person of Christ. And regardless of the way things look, and regardless of the way things appear, we would be able to say with Paul in Romans 8 that now there is not only no condemnation, but he says there is nothing that is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. Because Christ is the guarantor of God's covenant love and faithfulness to us. So as the writer says in Hebrews 12, let us therefore look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And let's pray. Father, again, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you for the reminder of your grace in Christ. Let our gaze ever be unto him. Let us look to him without wavering, because he is the guarantee of your grace and your love towards us. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.